A classic of science fiction literature adapted to the cinematic screen by a then rising talent within filmmaking, an often criticised and polarising adaptation of an often argued to be unadaptable novel, this is David Lynch's 1984 theatrical adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune. In comparison to David Lynch's other works, Dune is not held in such high acclaim, David Lynch himself disowning the film, having felt restricted in his creative vision. However, David Lynch's theatrical cut of Dune has garnered a dedicated following for its admirable attempt at adapting a challenging novel, a tale of conflict between the houses of Atreides and of Harkonnen as they battle over rulership of Arrakis, a desert planet which is the only source of spice, a highly sought after resource essential for interstellar travel and which is often protected by the indigenous people of Arrakis, the Frenum. Dune as a novel is complicated, filled with its own distinct lexicon that aids in the development of a unique narrative world. Depending on the edition, Dune is over 400 pages of complex spiritual science fiction, detailed with history, politics and economic conflict. David Lynch's film attempts to adapt this within 137 minutes to mixed results. In Derek Malcolm's original 1984 review of David Lynch's film, he wrote that Herbert has expressed himself satisfied with David Lynch's multi-million dollar summation for Dino De Laurentiis and it is certainly accomplished, cramming a lot into just over two hours Hours, though depth is inevitably sacrificed for width. In just over two hours, David Lynch's Dune doesn't quite give the clearest impression of Frank Herbert's world, attempting to condense a substantial book within its running time. It feels closer to a summary than a fully fleshed out adaptation. Condensing such an epic scale intricate narrative into a two hour running time certainly comes with its sacrifices. Some characters, such as the women of David Lynch's Dune, especially Charney, Paul Atreides' love interest and Frenum freedom fighter, feel underdeveloped and underutilised. In the case of Charney, her appearance seems to be only to serve as the easily gained love interest to Paul Atreides. Some aspects of David Lynch's Dune just do not receive the time necessary for development, while other aspects such as the Sandwalk are not even present within the film, the Sandwalk being an essential Frenum method to avoid attack from the giant sandworms of Arrakis. Due to this, David Lynch's Dune is not as faithful an adaptation science science fiction fans may be seeking, but David Lynch's distinct visual flair is present, having previously directed Eraserhead, The Elephant Man, and a string of fascinating experimental short films such as The Alphabet and The Grandmother, David Lynch has already established early within his career an incomparable visual style that we now recognise as Lynchian. Certain sequences within Dune utilise David Lynch's visual flair brilliantly, capturing that ethereal and dreamlike aesthetic that many will associate with his films shots across the dusty dunes of Arrakis, and the overlaid montages of various images of a spice melange high, Peter Bradshaw within his review of David Lynch's film reinforces this, writing that there are admittedly some moments of expressionist panache and dreamlike strangeness. It sometimes feels like a freewheeling sci-fi production of a lost Shakespeare Roman play. This visual flair of David Lynch's truly adds a layer of texture to a flawed adaptation, while as an adaptation, David Lynch's Dune sacrifices the depth of the novel, its ambitious visual embrace is undeniably Lynchian at the best of times. When Peter Bradshaw remarks that Dune sometimes feels like a freewheeling sci-fi production of a lost Shakespeare Roman play, the film does share elements with Shakespearean theatre. Outside of some campy overacting such as Kenneth Macmillan's excessive Baron Harkonnen and Stinger's Fade Rafa Harkonnen delivering a performance with as much charisma as the thong he wears, at its best Dune does provide admirable performances that hold gravitas, a cast ranging from Patrick Stewart, a prolific member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, Max von Sydow, a regular actor of Ingmar Bergman's filmography providing gravitas even within a small appearance, Sean Phillips providing a harrowing performance during a scene with the infamous Gom Jabbar, aided by David Lynch's intimidating, haunting visual style, and a respectable debut by Carl McLachlan, who would become a regular appearance in David Lynch's later productions. 
with a cast of admirable performances, Dune's narrative at its strongest contains betrayals, overthrowing of an established monarchical house, damages to reputations, and madness driven by greed for power. These are themes and events reminiscent of Shakespeare's most fascinating and intricate tragedies, Coriolanus, Titus Andronicus, Hamlet, Macbeth, adding an air of classical theatrics to a flawed yet enjoyable adaptation. With a film score by Toto, including an original theme tune by Brian Eno, David Lynch's Dune aimed for the heights and unfortunately fumbled. However, for as often as Dune might fall short, there is still much to admire and appreciate within the odd one out of David Lynch's filmography. In conclusion, David Lynch's Dune is a polarising production, one which sacrificed the integrity of adaptation and director's vision for a production that was likely intended to be healthy competition for a more successful science fiction fantasy blockbuster franchise popular at the time, Star Wars. However, despite feeling rushed in places, and so condensed in others that characterisation and world building suffers, David Lynch's Dune isn't a complete failure, retaining a distinct sense for visual aesthetic that still belongs underneath the Lynchian descriptor. Dune at its best can be Shakespearean, filled with betrayal, overthrowing rulers and greed, led with performances that, when they shine through, are truly engaging. A flawed production and far from a masterpiece, David Lynch's Dune still has much to offer that makes it deserving of its cult film status.